Big thanks to the members of my Patreon. In the year 1731, a massive thunderstorm was happening, and there was a small house in which there was a box filled with knives and forks made of metal. Suddenly, a lightning stroke hit the building, breaking the box. When the owner examined the box, he noticed that knives and forks are melted, while other things not made of metal were basically untouched. And that is not surprise, considering that metal is conductor. But what is surprising is that the owner noticed that the damaged knives and forks could now attract iron. So it was noted that lightning has the power of magnetizing the steel. And it was the first observation of a link between electricity and magnetism. In 1751, Benjamin Franklin tried to magnetize a saving needle by a discharge of a Leyden jar. And he was successful. Although it was doubtful whether this magnetization comes directly from the current because you could put the needle a little bit further away and it would still get magnetized. And the search for the link between electricity and magnetism began. And a gentleman who eventually found it is named Hans Christian Orsted, who took a compass needle and placed it near a current carrying wire. First, he placed the wire perpendicular to the needle and observed no effect. But then he tried to rotate the wire and set it parallel to the needle, and the effect was observed. This was published in the July of 1820. So, two seemingly separated phenomena were now linked, at least qualitatively, since Orsted didn't provide any mathematical formula that would describe this effect. But this effect was so weird that it needed some explanation. There has to be something in the air in the space around the conductor, and the Orsted called it the conflict of electricity. And I know it's kinda weird name for a physical entity, but it implies that this effect is yet to be understood. He wrote that non-magnetic bodies are transparent to this conflict, while magnetic bodies resist the penetration of this conflict, and therefore experience the force. He also understood that this conflict has to go in circles around, since the compass needle was deflected in one direction when above the wire and in the other when below. During the following years, physicists tried many experiments and eventually got a rough grasp of what should the mathematical formula for this force acting on the magnetic needle be, although in a kinda alien notation for us today. It was also understood that this conflict coming from the wire is of the same nature as the magnetic force itself and can also magnetize iron, which let physicists rightfully believe that two wires under current should act with a force on each other, which was confirmed by Andy Marie Ampere, who showed that two wires under current attract each other if the current is in the same direction and repel each other if they are in the opposite directions. And you might think that this mutual force between two current carrying wires must have been a necessary consequence of the Orsted findings, but it actually wasn't. For example, a pure iron bar can also influence the magnetic needle, but two bars next to each other exert no force on each other. So iron's magnetic properties are different than that of an actual magnet or current carrying wire. From all the experiments he has done, he eventually wrote a four fundamental laws for the mutual action between two current carrying conductors. The effect of the current is reversed when the direction of the current is reversed. No need to explain that one. The effect of a current flowing in a circuit twisted into small sinuosities is the same as if the circuit was smoothed out. This means that the wire doesn't have to be perfectly straight, but the magnetic effect sufficiently far away from the wire is the same. The force exerted by a closed circuit on an element of another circuit is at right angles to the later. So if you have a wire under current 
then the force acting on a small element of another current carrying wire is perpendicular to the direction of the current in this element. So if the element of the current is at 45 degrees to the original wire, the force will remain perpendicular to the direction of the element current, but the magnitude can be different. And lastly, the force between two elements of a circuit is unaffected when all linear dimensions are increased proportionally, the current strength remaining unaltered. Okay, this last one touches the most fundamental feature of electromagnetism, which is the invariance under scaling. So if you take each spatial component of space and scale it by the same factor while maintaining the same current strength, then the resulting force on the components of the experimental apparatus remain the same. It is maybe the best to illustrate it on a simple system. Imagine two closed circuits with a certain current I passing in them that act with a force of 10 newtons on each other. When you increase the distance between them, but you also increase the size of the apparatus by a factor of two, while maintaining the same currents, the resulting force will remain the same. So these are the four rules that helped Ampere to derive the mathematical formula for the Ampere's law. The heuristic way of how Ampere's law was derived could be worth another video. But it wasn't anything like we know it today, since the notion of electric and magnetic fields was not established yet. And therefore, Ampere's formula was describing a force between two infinitesimal current elements, separated by some vector distance r between them. But there was one flaw with the equation. And no, now is not the time for Maxwell to shine yet. The equation suggests that the force is proportional to the vector r, which means that the force is always directed in the same direction as the line connecting the two elements, no matter the orientation of the elements. But this seems to be in a contradiction with the third law, that the force acted on a current element should be perpendicular. And it took almost two decades to fix this issue by Hermann Grassmann. And the final and general formula that satisfies this third law looks like this. You might think that this is a big issue and that Ampere shouldn't be credited by the discovery of the Ampere's law if his equation is incorrect. But while it seems like it for the current elements, in reality we always work with the closed circuits. And those two expressions always converge to the same results for the closed circuits. And there hasn't been done any clear experiment that would distinguish these two. The reason why we consider the Grassmann's equation as better is because it aligns nicely with the concepts of fields, which is much more beautiful and intuitive way how to think of electromagnetism, which was given to us by Michael Faraday. And the Grassmann's equation could be rewritten in the form of these fields which was done by James Clark Maxwell. There is a big rabbit hole I could go through regarding the differences between the Ampere's and Grassmann's formulation of this law. The history of physics is so huge compared to what we usually learn. So maybe in another video. The way Maxwell wrote this law is again kinda alien for us today. But with some manipulation it can be written in a compact form via vector calculus. So these alpha, beta, gamma things were just different components of the magnetization field, which we denote as H. And the PQR represent the XYZ components of the current densities. But there is this little prime there on each of them. And the reason is that Maxwell thought of the current density a little bit differently than Ampere or Grassmann. For him, current was made of a regular current density plus some additional term, which he added for a good reason. And if you write everything out in a vector notation, you get the equation for Ampere's Maxwell's law, as we know it today. This is in the form of the magnetization field and electric displacement field, but in a vacuum you can easily relate them to more commonly used form using electric intensity and magnetic induction. The question becomes, 
Why Maxwell thought of the current density differently and added this time-varying electric displacement field into the equations? It is a step of such a crucial importance that it is considered to be his most important contribution to the electromagnetic theory. So let's break it down. So without this additional term, the equation for Ampere's law looks like this. And the physical content of this equation is exactly the same as in the Grassmann's equation, meaning you can derive one from the other, where this J is a regular current density as Ampere or Grassmann understood it. But although less compact but more intuitive way how to write this equation is in its integral form, like this. So the way how to understand this equation is the following. If you have a current distribution in a space, for example like this, then you can pick a certain surface S and integrate this current density distribution over this surface, and it will tell you about the magnetic field on the boundary of this surface. Or you can read it other way around, integrate the magnetic field over arbitrary closed line, and it will tell you the total current passing through the surface enclosed by this boundary. Okay, so the thing is, that the shape of this surface is independent of the shape of the boundary. For example, look at this plastic bottle. It has a boundary here, and the rest of the bottle is the surface. But if you take another one, the boundaries on this one is the same. So they have the same boundaries but different surfaces. So if you integrate through this surface and this surface, it shouldn't matter. Or you can think of, for example, this plastic bottle. It also has a boundary, like here, but you can twist this plastic part however you like and integrate through it and you shouldn't get different result. But this is the origin of the problem with the Ampere's law, because it gives you just too much freedom. Imagine this situation where you have a circuit with a gap in it. When you connect such circuit to the source, some people would say that nothing happens because the circuit is not complete. But that is not true. The charge from the source start to accumulate on the plate of capacitor. And since like charges repel each other, they will repel the charges on the other side of the plate, causing a movement of charge. And if you placed ampermeter here, you would detect current. Of course, this would last only for a while until the plates of capacitor are fully saturated, and the battery has not enough energy to pump more charges into the capacitor. And the positive charges on the other side are so depleted that there is not enough field strength to push any other away, and the ampermeter would read zero. Now let's focus on the part where capacitor is charging up, and the current is flowing. If you want to determine what the magnetic field is, for example at this boundary, then you can pick any arbitrary surface like this one, and you will get non-zero result, since there is a current passing in the wire. But you can also choose this one, but the problem is that here there is zero current and therefore magnetic field should be zero at that boundary. And this is inconsistency, right? This shows us that we can't choose the surface of integration arbitrary. The fact is that if you were to measure the magnetic field around this system, you would find out that it's non-zero even in this part of the circuit. But if you draw a boundary, and choose the simplest surface possible, you would get zero. But if you choose it like this, then you would get the correct result. So where does the magnetic field in this area originate from if it's not the current? Well, when the capacitor is charging up, the electric intensity between the plates is changing with time until the capacitor is saturated. Maybe it's better to say that it is the electric displacement field that is changing, since there can be some medium between the plates, and the displacement field takes the polarization effects into account. But if it's in the vacuum, then these two relate to each other, 
just by a simple constant epsilon naught. Electric displacement field has a unit of coulomb per meter squared, and therefore time varying electric displacement field will have units of coulomb per second per meter squared, which is ampere per meter squared, which is the same as the current density J. So time varying electric displacement field behaves exactly the same as classical current density J, and therefore also produce magnetic field as classical current. So now, if you add this to the equation for the Ampere's law, you will get rid of the problem, because if you choose this surface to integrate over, this will be zero, and this will give you non-zero contribution. But if you were to choose this surface, then this will be zero, but this term will not. But if you think about it, this is the first indication that these fields are kinda real, because in this part of the circuit, there is only a field thingy going on. There is no current or anything truly real. And this was the crucial part that led to the discovery of the electromagnetic waves, because now electric field can create magnetic field. And with the discovery of the equation for the Faraday's law, again done by Maxwell, we see that magnetic field can in turn create electric field. So one induces the other and the other induces the one. Nice symbiosis that can propagate through space indefinitely, unless there is something physical that will absorb the energy. If you are interested in how we know that light is an electromagnetic wave, maybe watch this video. Thank you for watching and thank you for your support on Patreon. I see you next time.